Cool. I, I Thank feel like I feel like we should have Mike speak with an Australian accent just for. <laughs> 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 uh, so, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, for those who missed it, uh, you know, we, we're trying to change the format up a little bit today, and um, I really want to open it up to you guys to ask as many questions as possible or as you want. Uh, so we're going to do this in a, in a panel format. But let me just maybe uh, you know, start with, with one question, which is a very practical one. So how do you get started with all this stuff? Right? Let, let's assume, think of it as a, the, the timeline of a life of a startup. I'm a New York-based startup. I raised a million dollar in seed money. I'm you know, working really hard to just figure out my core business. I guess two questions. You know, what, what, how do I uh, make sure that I don't make any mistakes in the beginning that would preclude me later from building, you know, a, 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 a big data infrastructure, uh, one. And, and two, at what point do I start thinking about, do I bring in a, uh, you know, do I bring in a data scientist? Do I start a Kaggle competition? How, how does that work at a very practical level for a startup that's not deep into the data business? So you should just um, use Mike's uh, system. Um, Drew, Drew, it'll get you sorted. And then once you've done that, you just run a Kaggle competition, and you're pretty much done. You sort of go off and enjoy. Oh, that was easy. <laughs> I think you start with quid. You, you find meta markets in the space, and then you <laughs> prepare your data for Kaggle. Now, maybe I, I'll, I'll try to give a um, tr try to give a, a sense of you know uh, my experiences working with with data. I think so. Maybe I'll, I'll define it in in the inverse as as what in terms of what not to do. Um, so I think a, a lot of, uh, and this is both on an individual and on a firm basis, I think that a lot of people who are interested in data science will decide that, you know, I, got it, I should go take a bunch of courses um, and read a bunch of books and um, check a series of boxes. You know, uh, and I think that's actually the wrong approach. I think um, the best thing you can do, truthfully, is to have define a problem that you will need to use data to solve and then attempt to solve that problem. Uh, and that problem could be if you don't have, if you're an individual and you don't have a startup that's generating data, then I think going to Kaggle and entering a competition and getting your butt kicked uh, and realizing that you need to uh, improve your skills, I think is, it should be very uh, empirically driven I think is the most important thing because um, nothing substitutes, especially in this r regime or realm of data science, there aren't courses out there. There aren't books written yet. Um, it, there's no substitute for experience. Because a lot of, I mean, those that are, are often wrong. Um, they're terrible because, books. Because they're from people that haven't had their butt kicked. Right. You know? mm. um, so there's a lot of bad advice around. Yeah. Um, I mean, so yeah, becoming a data scientist by trying to solve data science problems in a competitive way is a good way to get good at it. Otherwise, it's like in a running race where you can't see how anyone else is doing. As a company, you know, there are a few decisions you have to make. And I, at the last Strata conference, I helped a few people out who, who, who came along. They were interested in building data science teams at their company. And I introduced them to a few people. And you know, there were some common questions, one of which was, at what point do I do Hadoop? Mm -hmm. And the answer I got from everybody was the same, which is not until you absolutely have to. Mm -hmm. you know, Because um, there's a good way to spend a hell of a lot of time mm -hmm. not actually creating any business value. Mm -hmm. um, which is not to say there isn't value in Hadoop, but you'll know when you need it because all your brilliant insight generating algorithms and models and visualizations need to be scaled up. Um, at what point do I need a data scientist on staff? Now, um, uh, you might not necessarily recognize them as a data scientist, they might not recognize themselves as a data scientist, but if there's someone who can code and can munge data and can do statistics and has a pragmatic mind, they're a data scientist. Um, and you know, find somebody who either has competed successfully in competitions or who has solved real world business problems using data. Um, so you know, other, other than that, I'd say yeah, you don't you don't need big vendor stuff um, from the start. You just need to be using good people, um, you know, tools like R, and just make sure that the best way to to not look back in a year's time and feel sorry is to make sure you're capturing the data now that that you'll want to use then. So so keep everything that you can. Hmm. Yeah. Sure. 
Okay. Well, to, to the data scientist question, so let's say you get to the stage, which sounds like it's now, where you need to, to get a data scientist. Do you, I think there was, there was a debate that you had, I think at Strata, Michael, do, do, do you go for someone who has deep domain expertise? So if you're a finance startup, you want to find the you know, finance expert? Or do you find somebody who is like a super strong machine learning person that will then be able to learn the domain? You know, so we, I, maybe I'll give a recap. So at Strata, uh, a few weeks ago in, in Santa Clara, California, we held a data science debate where we brought a group of data scientists on stage. And uh, the Oxford style debate question was if you're hiring your first data scientist, what should you favor? Domain expertise or machine learning expertise? I know it was popular because a lot of people left the last hour of my tutorial to see that. So. <laughs> to go over, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, you know, of course, the, the, the answer, like all good debate questions, is it depends, right? Um, but we try to frame it in that if you had to hire your first data scientist. And I think the, the conclusion that came out of that was if you... Uh, in some ways, we use Kaggle as sort of a, a way to frame the, the, the answer, which is if your data is already structured well enough and you've got a set of criteria to define the success of your machine learning algorithm, then you should hire the strongest pure machine learner you can find. You should find someone who would, you know, is a glaciologist from Cambridge. But if you haven't gotten to a, a point where you've defined your problems, and you've defined your data and the criteria uh, well enough, then it's important to get someone who has some domain expertise that can, step one is asking the right question. Um, and often, you know, if you get that, that person um, to structure the problem, then they can work well. With I, that, I, I really feel like in some ways the orthogonality of these concepts is, is not an assumption we should start with. Because when I look at who are good data scientists I know, they all have four characteristics. Mm -hmm. They are all highly tenacious, mm -hmm. highly creative, very curious, and have deep technical skills. So, you know, when we look at, for example, um, Claudia Perlich, who's a New York mm -hmm. local who has been perhaps more successful in competitive data science than anyone in the world, mm -hmm. three-time back-to-back KDD Cup winner, the world's longest running and largest machine learning mm -hmm. competition. She won her KDD Cups in totally different areas. What was it, breast cancer imaging, and I think there was a telecoms churn right. prediction. And, Online you know, advertising. Uh, but, you know, the thing about somebody like Claudia is you could put her into a room with, with any kind of business problem in data, and mm -hmm. the reason she's been successful as a mm -hmm. data scientist is that she's good at being mm -hmm. highly pragmatic and mm -hmm. highly driven on the actual outcome mm -hmm. to be mm -hmm. achieved. Mm -hmm. So, you know, my view would be if somebody's proven themselves as a data scientist in one domain, you know, they will be able to actually use your data in another domain very, very quickly. Yeah, I, I think that in, in most cases, uh, you, I think in most cases you want to find, you want to find someone who is a proven data scientist and not, I think it's be very careful that you don't select someone who has just a degree in statistics or a PhD in uh, applied physics. All the physicists tend to be pretty good. They do, scientists. but having said that, the person who, who won our HIV machine learning comp uh, competition beating the one of the people from the team that built IBM's Je Jeopardy winning Watson, Watson. group, uh, he was an um, English literature major. Ah. So, you know, it, it's not all about what university you yeah. went to. I think, uh, you know, one, one test we do at Metamarkets when we were hiring um, uh, data science types is we gave them a hack test. Uh, people would uh, s you know, sit down in front of a laptop, especially if you're a startup. Um, and the hack test essentially consisted of I gave them uh, you know, a 100 megabyte file, and the first column in that file was a, a date string. Um, but it was a, kind of a messed up date string. And, uh, and I said, I think it was e actually it wasn't even that messed up. It was epoch, the you know, number of seconds that have passed since you know, 1970, January 1. And I asked them to convert that epoch string into um, a human readable date string of, any, of their own choosing. And the amount of, and so put them in front of the Unix command line and say, okay, like this is the hack test. Uh, and if someone can't get an answer to that, cannot pull that column off and turn it into a human readable date string in the order of minutes, you do not want that person as a data scientist. Uh, you know, People solve it many ways. Perl one-liners. There are Unix command line tools you can use. You can, you can pipe it into R. You, you can even, you know, there's many things you can do to solve that problem. 
But that's the sort of deep technical and you know, tenaciousness. You just need to solve problems and get through that. So you have a lot of academics who are used to, you know, they can, they can answer a question uh, in a Stanford statistics exam. And we had many Stanford students come and fail that test. Um, you come back after 20 minutes and they haven't gotten anywhere. Um, you don't have time in a startup to wait for people to, to, to solve those kinds of problems. So there's a lot of practicality, I think. Uh, and Claudia, I think, is a real example of that. Uh, I think the other thing <clears throat> on, a, on a data scientist is that this sort of this idea of the mythical data scientist, if I get them in, they'll solve all these problems. So they're, they're really like you know, a, a trigger puller in Iraq. You've got to have, for every trigger puller, you've got to have seven kind of support staff. And I think you know, to kind of really let a data scientist kind of do their work, you, you've got to have support staff for them. And that's you know, guys you know, sorting out the infrastructure and, and people also thinking about the product that, they are, that they're building. Mm -hmm. And basically, you know, put that together as a team as opposed to just kind of put a data scientist around. Because one thing you probably don't want your data scientist doing is trying to build infrastructure for you. And um, so it's kind of, you know, know the ratio, and I think seven to one is probably about the right number. Great. All right, let's get started. So this, this is going to be Mike Spatzeran. If you could please uh, just introduce yourself very quickly, your name and who you work uh, with or for. Hi, my name is Michael Selleck, and uh, I am a freelance data scientist. Um, one thing I've noticed, I haven't checked Kaggle in a while, uh, a few months, but except for the Heritage Health Prize, the prizes offered seem to be very, very small relative to the financial value uh, of, the, of, of solving the problem. Um, and I'm not sure... So I see a lot of professors, uh, <laughs> you know, taking their time to do that work because it, for them, is is value outside of the prize. But for um, wh why is it that companies do not offer, uh, like it was ten thousand dollars to solve bond trading or something, <laughs> you know, it, a hedge fund should be paying tens of millions of dollars, you know, and uh, why why is it not going that in that direction? Well. <clears throat> I guess part of the answer is in what you can't see. And what you can't see are all of the private competitions. And the private competitions are the people who have been successful in those public competitions get invited to compete in competitions that you can't see. And the reason that they exist is because there's a lot of data problems which, where the data can't be released on the internet. So a private competition situation, 10 to 15 um, successful Kaggle participants get invited to compete against each other. The prizes in those are generally larger and also, generally speaking, everybody except last place in those wins money. Um, so we are seeing the prize money in those starting to get bitted up. Um, having said that, the prize money still has a long way to go. And the reason it's got a long way to go when it hasn't got there yet is it's just the, the nature of a marketplace. So currently, the Kaggle marketplace is not very liquid. And in fact, it's very unbiased. Uh, it's very um, uh, biased. There are over 30,000 data scientists, and in terms of public competitions, which are the only ones that everybody gets to enter, there are maybe five or six running at a time. So um, as we start to scale up the hosting side, and so for example, maybe Geico will look at all state success in actuarial modeling and go, oh, we want in on that too. Maybe once three or four insurance companies have gone there, we would think maybe the boards of every insurance company would be going, well, if we don't do this, then we're going to have actuarial models three times worse than everybody else. You know, we'll be in deep shit. Um, and so at that point, you would expect to see the prize money getting bidded up in order to ensure that, that the, the Claudias of this world are the people who get attracted to those competitions. So I think liquidity will, will lead to prizes. Um, but, you know, in the meantime, as you mentioned, there are plenty of people who compete for reasons other than money. Um, so as I said, it takes about half an hour a day to be an effective competitor. And you know, by doing so, you get a lot back in terms of not only recognition, but also you know, learnings about yourself and your algorithms. And also, you can build a community of other successful data scientists um, who, you, who you work with. Hi, my name is Peter. Uh, I work for a company called Brillig. We were actually talking about you today. So, <laughs> pretty cool stuff. So, Brillig is trying to build Kaggle's cooperative market of different data scientists into real-time bidding. 
So imagine the ability to build algorithms for each one of the things. Ultimately, there's going to be some form of need for, uh, what's it called, a quid labs to be able to recognize that and then display that to the CMO so they can understand which algorithms you're going to bid for. Um, that's what we call targeting bins in our, in our, our, our model. Um, the opposite side is something called relationship bins uh, for the consumer side of this. And this is all, I'm sorry guys, this is all geared towards online advertising. With the consumer getting more, you know, having more desire and, you know, being either from, you know, just general cultural standpoint or from, you know, regulation from uh, the government, where do you guys think that the consumer facing algorithm is going to sit? Who's going to end up building them? Is it on the browser side? Is it going to end up being Facebook? Are we going to have Kaggle, uh, sorry, yeah, Kaggle um, competitions for, you know, your own personal uh, concierge service? Um, I, think, I think one of the interesting things is we move out of a space of big data into what really is important is the algorithms that run on top of the data. And you know, quite often times these are pretty stupid, actually. They're pretty dumb um, algorithms. And we'll see an advancement in, in the, the quality of algorithms, probably driven by a lot of the R&D that's kind of happening in spaces like this. I think, you know, could you have your own personal algorithm? At the moment, when you go on to um, Facebook, the, the, the news feed that's showing down there is is an algorithm that, although it's personalized to you, personalized, it's really the same algorithm that everyone has. And it's an algorithm that's optimized to showing ads um, on the side of the page. So my friends that I now interact with um, are dictated by an algorithm that's trying to optimize to make me click banners on the side. And I start to think, well, is that the algorithm that I want to tell me who I want to be friends with? Is that, you know, people you may know, is that something that I actually want to trust anymore? So I think the idea of a personalized algorithm that's set up to not just kind of tweaked on, on the input models for me, but actually personalized for me, I think is something we can probably look forward to, but in about seven years. <laughs> Who do you think is going to build it? Um, you've got a company, you could, you could do it. I think it's something that's really important though. I think we sort of, we, we, we've, given a lot of, um, we've given a lot of control to algorithms. And, you know, I, I, you know the, the, the kind of, the information that, that we consume in news is, is algorithmically generated. Our friends are algorithmically generated. The path that we take from A to B as a result of Google Maps is algorithmically generated. And what are these algorithms serving? They're not really serving me, although you know, I do get some benefit. Yeah, I, I think that um, I think I, my answer would be like a modification of the golden rule. So the golden rule is that you know, he who has the gold rules. <laughs> uh, I think this is information rules. Uh, he who has or she who has the information rules. Analytics and algorithms are light. Data is very heavy. So the, the, the natural course of things will be that the algorithms will move to where the data lives and the entities that have the data will ultimately win because of that strategic advantage. And I think uh, so you'll see that I think there, there, there are some real implications for this in terms of um, sort of information structure of the economy that companies that have uh, are almost data conglomerates um, will be much more able to compete in terms of doing better consumer targeting. There is no question that most of Facebook's value, much of it not even realized, is that they have not just data about who we are, um, which they have, they have it in a, in a social context so that people are far less likely to lie about who they are on Facebook. Um, uh, because it's in a and it's in a web of other relationships. Um, same for LinkedIn. Uh, so I think that the media conglomerates, you guys like Facebook uh, and uh, you know others, are going to have enormous power. That even if their algorithms are not as strong, um, we know Peter Norvig of Google has said before that more data beats better algorithms. Um, I think it's ultimately about the data. Uh, and the, he, who, he, he or she who has the data wins. But I think if you look at financial markets, right, you know, the, the sort of the advent of data becomes sort of ubiquitous, like getting tick data for, you know, you can, anyone can log in, you can buy your Bloomberg stream and away you go. The, the valuable stuff, the stuff that Goldman goes to court over, you know, is, is the, the black box algorithm, the 32 megabyte file that someone sent across to Poland. I mean, that, that's the stuff that's, that's the real value. I mean, the, the data will become ubiquitous in, mm. in any kind of mature market. So, you know, everyone will essentially have that data. So I, I, I want to talk about something that you just <laughs> said because um, I think it's really interesting. Um, 
more data beats better algorithms. So, common, so, common saw. So, <laughs> it's not quite what Peter Norvig said, and I have had this discussion with Peter, um, and I put it to him that this is something that is often mischaracterized, yes. um, which he agreed with. Um, You've got to remember that when Peter Norvig talks about the power of data, he uses it particularly in his, in his really terrific talk about this, the unreasonable effectiveness of data, in the context of um, automated computer translation. Yeah. So when we talk about how much data do you need, and so to come to another of my pet rants, you know, do I need big data, um, you have to look at the complexity of the underlying causal system. So in this case, the complexity of the underlying causal system is the entire richness of human language, which is quite rich. Um, and so if you want to use basically nothing but data to translate from one to the other, you're going to need a lot of data. Mm. Um, on the other hand, most things that machine learners deal with day to day, such as um, is Mike going to crash his car in the next year, and if so, how much is it going to cost, is not nearly as complex as the the entire richness of human language. Mm. And so, for example, when Allstate put up that question, they had a couple of gigabytes of data. And in fact, every single problem that, if I can remember, solved on Kaggle, many of which had never been solved before, all fit in the, uh, a laptop's memory. That's, and, why, that's why they use R, right? Well, that's, or, or <laughs> I mean, or they use R because, yeah, the power of using a highly Interactive you tool. And you can store it all in memory. Yeah, it's much more it's much more powerful. And when people do put out bigger data sets, people normally sample out at two gigabytes. That, that's that's it. I would say in an emerging market where there hasn't been data before, like I think data trumps algorithms. Like I, th I think that's to your point of like data being valuable. I think I think it, it, it moves across from well, you've got data to yeah. So what? You've got data. Well, if you don't know what data you need yet, like I said before, that's collect right. it all. But when it comes to algorithms, I mean, I mean, and even, for example, Google Translate does now use algorithms. It turned out that just using the data enough. wasn't enough. Yeah, I, I think there's a bit of, you have a bit of a bias, though, because on Kaggle there is a, a tendency to put data sets that do fit of a certain size. Uh, and I, certainly some, some problems are, are, I think, more amenable to better algorithms than um, you know, problems of, of vision, of language, right? High complexity problems, but I think in the case of targeting consumers for who's going to be better at figuring out whether I want to take a vacation to Cancun or, or, or to Hawaii, it's going to be the company that has the most data points about which sites I visited in the last two weeks are going to have a much better idea of my, my intent as a consumer because it's not that complicated. Uh, I think yeah, I guess I'd say two things there. I mean, yeah, I guess in some ways there's a bias, but in another sense, people come to us with problems to solve, not data that they have. And so, for example, the Royal Astronomical Society were actually the ones that came to us with the dark matter data set. And when it came to us, it was 900 gigabytes. Mm. So um, I pointed out to them that we could use an equivalent 700 megabyte data set to solve the same problem. Um, and I think that is often the case. Often it's, this is the data I have, rather than this is the data you need. The other thing I'd say is often building the models versus running the models right. is different. Right. Running the models often needs the big data. Right. So the, the, the unfortunate irony, which obviously you guys are, are a gap you're bridging, is that the people who have the data don't always have the right algorithms to run in that data. And those who have the right algorithms often don't have any data to run them on. So, yes. so you know, one, one example you're of You're connecting data with algorithms. Yes. So, you know, exactly. Kaggle may bring those two groups together, but uh, I did some work for a North American telco, and, you know, we all talk about uh, social networks and LinkedIn and Twitter and Facebook. But if you want to know who has the most powerfully predictive social graphs on the planet, it's the telcos. Because who you call and who you text is an extraordinarily strong indicator of who you actually are connected to in a social way. And they've got GPS. And they've got location data as well. Or well, pseudo GPS. So and the other great ones are the um, payment providers, Visa and MasterCard. They right. have nice data. And so the, the incredible thing is the value of those data streams are so high that they could practically give away the phone service for free and just monetize the information about but, who you're connected to. But they're not. They want to do both. 
But if you, um, at the moment, they're not. At the moment, they're not. I, I work with a lot of the offline data providers who have that transactional yeah. record, and it's one of the things that we've been trying to do is tie the offline world with the online world and then bring in the third phase of the market um, the opportunity for algorithm makers to come in and, and use that. And you're absolutely right. You know, they, a lot of the people who do have the data do not know how to work it. Um, and, and there is a lot of value that is just removed from their primary business. But these guys right now, and I deal with a lot of offline folks who have this information, no idea what the true implications are once they mix this up with everybody else's, the true inherent value of the data. You sell people more stuff. It can be too creepy. And one of the reasons that, God, I don't want to overtake your panel and make this a pitch for yeah, me. Yeah, here's the mic back. Yeah, come, <laughs> take, come talk to me afterwards. Yeah. Here. I think it's interesting at what point does it become creepy? Um, at, what point, at what point do we go, oh, I'm not, I'm not sure. And I think it's like, I'm not sure I want to share that information. I think that's actually gone. I don't think we get to go back to that world anymore. I think the world where we share information is, we, we, we're just, we, we're, we're there. Um, I mean, when you've got something like Facebook kind of um, engineering almost a social game to hit the dopamine receptors to, to share a little bit more information to get a like button back, I mean, you, you've got an addictive platform that 800 million people are addicted to sharing information on, and we're probably not going to wean ourselves off that. Um, what they have to walk the line of is when it gets creepy is when I start showing ads for certain things that I probably shouldn't be showing you. It's kind of like the, uh, the, um, the equivalent of showing the... Um, the, uh, the lung cancer on, on a cigarette pack, you, you kind of go, oh, that's the result of this. Um, and then you start to realize what they actually know. So I think that the line they have to walk before it gets creepy is, is not so much the data line, but it's the algorithm line. And there'll be creepy algorithms and uncreepy algorithms. Well, I, just one more thing. <laughs> I know why the original question was, is there going to be a consumer-facing algorithm which is going to weed through the creepy stuff? Yeah, I think there will be. People, the, the rich people will be able to afford their own algorithm. The poor people will have one driven by ads. <laughs> All right, another question, please. Over there. Carter Schoenwald. Uh, I guess I'm a freelance computer scientist right now. Um, so I'd like to go back to a point that one of you guys raised earlier, which is, uh, and I've been told, uh, which is you were saying that in your mind, it, I forget who said it, that you consider that the data scientists should be different from the people who are actually sort of helping put things into production. Yeah. Uh, um, I've actually, so one, uh, one, one place I recently just worked at actually said that was a critique about most of the data scientists that they were, would interview for positions. That they need these huge teams, that the ones they typically encounter would need these huge teams just to, to be able to work. Uh, what are your thoughts on that as also in some ways being possibly a critique of some of the... I mean, I, I think you can. I mean, you, you can run it on 3 to 1 ratio. You could run on a 2 to 1 ratio. I, I just don't think it runs as well as 7 to 1. If you look at all the big hedge funds that are running, if you think of their kind of data scientists versus that, they're all at about the 6 to 1, 7 to 1 ratio on their teams. I, I think that's... It's, it's almost... You know, that's um, the standard kind of product team. Because what's a data scientist but really a product manager? Um, as for someone who's like, this is how I have an algorithm. The algorithm becomes the product and they, they basically implement it. So there's sort of that sort of number, I think, kind of conforms to, to what a data scientist really is when they're inside of a company. So in some sense what you're saying is that everyone works better when they have more assistance. Is, is that what I'm kind of I mean, of an apple say? pie is nice, right? What? Sorry. I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, you could kind of genericize it down to everyone works better when they have assistance. No, I, I, I think it's a data scientist needs support to do their work effectively. And, you know, it, the actual thing is like, well, what skills you need in a data scientist? I mean, you know, the ability to kind of, you know, munge data to run infrastructure to kind of create um, a business case for it to productize it, deliver it on time. I mean, one person doesn't have all of these things. And the kind of the mythical data scientist that will solve my problems is is really, I think, the, the right person to, with the right team around them, as opposed to a single kind of you know, superstar. I think, I think it's about having a contract between what your data scientist does and what your infrastructure team does. So often, I think the best form of that contract is SQL. Yes. So you simply say, look, infrastructure team, um, we want to create a separate analytic sandbox where we push the data to. Because the last thing you want is your data scientist running queries against your operational system. Um, <laughs> I think we all know what happens when that goes down. Uh, and if you have your data scientists give them the expectation of 
they need to know SQL, uh, then if you've got Hive installed on your Hadoop cluster, they can run their queries and get their data. But it's critical that they have you know, a certain level of, of data engineering expertise. One thing that Claudia, um, who Jeremy was mentioning about at Strata, she said, I have one rule, which is, and she's you know, renowned data scientist, said, I never let other people pull my data for yeah. me. I think it's critical that the, the person who is doing the algorithmic work have the ability to pull the data out of the system because it's an iterative process. This is why you know, speed is so important because if it takes four hours to run a query, often that first query you run is not the right one. Um, so I think it's about having a good contract between the data scientist and your infrastructure it, team. Every, every top data scientist I know can code right. and can oh, code really, really damn well. So yeah. I mean, you know, to, I wouldn't hire somebody in data science unless they know SQL and a whole bunch of other things right. as well, because that's what that's what's required for really constructive, creative problems. But what they don't need to know is MapReduce. I don't think that you. Sh it's okay for a data scientist like Claudia. Uh, the evidence is when when they install Hive, which is a SQL layer on top of Hadoop. Cladera's Jeff Hammerbacher has told me that once you install Hive onto a Hadoop cluster, the usage of that cluster typically goes up by a factor of 10 um, because you lower the friction of getting data out of that system. I, I don't think that, um, I mean, I'll speak for myself. I've done a lot of data hacking. I'm not a Java programmer. Uh, yeah. I can write R, I can do Python, I can do Perl, I can do Unix, but writing down to the level of, of you know, MapReduce scripts in Java, I think that's... I guess it's a continuum. I mean, yeah. You know, I, I would I would much rather somebody did know MapReduce. I, I mean, it would be great, right? Um, I mean, yeah. if, you, if you had someone that could sure, work the sure. full stack. But, yeah. I mean, the point there, I think, is if you can get it to that SQL level interface, like, you open your pool of potential candidates mm -hmm. massively, and you also, I think, stop it at a good point, too, when people go beyond their capabilities. Jeremy, I'm sure, writes MapReduce. He's, no, he's not. This, you know, this yeah. guy is not available for hire. At no, I mean, it would cost you, it would cost you a lot. <laughs> <laughs> hey. There's always a price, right? <laughs> um, hi, my name's Eric. Um, in my previous life, I was a computational biologist, and um, I watched through the 90s as um, the promise of genomics was really elevated and it was going to save pharma. And now I talk to my friends who are chemical scientists at pharma companies, and they're all freaking out because they're going to lose their jobs because mm. we basically can't discover drugs anymore. Mm. Um, and that really seemed to be an area where there was all this data generated, and there was this tremendous amount of hype. And it's totally failed to kind of live up to that hype, at least on kind of the, um, the IPO-relevant timescale, mm -hmm. let's say. Um, where do you guys think the hype is right now in the space of data? You know, where, where do you think it's being oversold? And kind of where do you, where should budding data scientists can, be avoiding? Can I start with your assertion there? Because actually I think that area is about to take off. Um, <laughs> so get back into it before it's too late. I mean, I am seeing chemoinformatics, which is the field of actually discovering, you know, discovering the property of chemicals by looking at their properties, you know, just starting to kick in. Part of the problem was that in the 90s, People were just doing a shitty job of this stuff, you know. Like, you look at the state of QSAR now. So QSAR is the regression algorithms used in chemoinformatics. The, the papers coming out are 10 to 20 years out of date mm. in terms of machine learning capabilities. There just aren't good data scientists working in these fields. And they're just starting to realise that, and they're just starting to happen. Um, ditto with genomics, you know. i I'm, I'm got some very, very interesting projects coming up looking at using gene sequence data in massively new ways. Mm -hmm. So I, I actually think the hype was 15 years ahead of the capabilities. There. So uh, I'm going to disagree with you because I, I, my doctorate is in computer science and biology. And I, uh, yeah. my first job out of college was as a programmer for the Human Genome Project. Um, so I also you know, thought, it, I'll say this, uh, bioinformatics is a great tra training ground for data science because unlike physics uh, or applied math, you're working with complex heterogeneous data sets. Uh, and certainly, you know, R as a, as a statistical environment, uh, in large part, it was driven, its adoption was driven in the, um, the life sciences space. I will agree with you and say that I think it's maybe a couple of decades away. Uh, but I think the real issue is that 
I have a lot of opinions about biotech, but the real challenge is that, you know, like you said, IPO timescale, the, the value creation of creating some algorithm or some new drug target is so far away from when the money changes hands, um, you know, when that target gets approved and turned into a drug, that it's difficult for those entities to make money. Well, what um, about chemoinformatics, Mark? You don't think that's moving forwards rapidly at this stage? I, I mean, I, I guess I would have to sort of dig into the literature <laughs> today and see what's going on, but my sense is you that, don't know. That, that truthfully the, the power of data to change the way the drugs are developed has actually not moved the needle um, nearly as much. Most big pharma actually have turned, reduced their investment in R&D, uh, and many of, it's a great place to recruit data scientists is out of these uh, pharma R&D labs. Is, yeah. um, but to, to maybe get to your question about where the hype is in the big data space, I think that I have I have a model where I think of it, there are broad enabling technologies at the bottom of the stack um, that companies who are devising new ways of storage or doing uh, new you know, stream ingestion, there's a lot of exciting things happening at the infrastructure level that I think is a good place to get involved. And then I think at the top of the stack, um, looking for focused applications and services that use data to drive value. I think there's a whole set of startups out there that are pretty focused and say, hey, you know, we're going to, like clout, we're going to use data to, and clout's maybe a crappy company because their algorithms are bad, but we're going to use data, <laughs> no offense to anyone here. He's got a, he's got a low score. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but companies that are looking at news curation or like travel prismatic. prediction or prismatic mm. is, a, is a great company um, out in San Francisco doing a better job of news curation. Um, travel prediction. Uh, there's lots of companies that are doing what may seem, seem like prosaic or pedestrian things, but because it's so easy to build a data stack, to get something running on Amazon, um, you have companies that can really do a better job um, with an application or service where data is fueling, um, fueling it. So let me do that point. I mean, all of you guys are selling to customers at this stage, right? What's the, what's the gap between, I mean, how much evangeliz evangelization do you need to do? I mean, you've got to be selling, right? Um, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I think, you know, for us, we're selling in against this, essentially, um, you know, your, your sort of your three-month McKinsey engagement. And, um, you know, that, you know, for, for whatever it is, is I, I think probably the sort of um, the bar for us. And we, if we can kind of come in and offer cheaper, faster, and kind of more insightful, um, and we're talking sort of order of magnitude stuff that you do in three months, you can do in, you know, a week, stuff that would cost $3 million, you can do you know, for a few tens of thousands. And um, the kind of insights that you can get, you know, sort of single dimensional versus multi, it, it, in, in many ways it kind of does, you know, sell itself um, to it. And I think if you, if you kind of have a product that generally kind of works and you can kind of look at it and go, I, I, you know, I, I want that, then that, that's a good level. I think, you know, Jeremy kind of talked about the stuff. You, you've got you've to have the, the stuff perform. You know, you've got to see how fast it runs. And, you know, that, that should be the selling. The nice thing about data is it's like, well, this is where you are and this is where this is. And you want that delta or not? Well, I mean, I don't know. Like asking us, in a, in a, in a sense, it's not fair because these are three pretty successful companies and fairly well known. I mean, like with Kaggle, you know, our sales guys say there is no selling process. Like people, okay, once we start talking to them, they're already engaged. A selection bias. Yeah, the challenge, the challenge is, you know, for us is kind of getting people through the strategic process of understanding what's the best problem to solve, what data to use. You know, there's, everybody knows that they want to get insights from their data, and you know, all of the people on this stage are well known as being people that have those solutions. So I'm not sure sales challenges are at the top of our list of problems, perhaps. I mean, I think if you're thinking about joining, uh, you know, and, and I guess I'll say the easiest sales that we make as, as meta markets is when we sell to people who are already sort of drinking the Kool-Aid, in a sense. Uh, and by that, I would define them as uh, companies that are already on the cloud. Mm -hmm. Because if you have a company that's storing its data in S3, it's like going to be a lot easier to, to work with their data. Um, yeah. Companies are already running Hadoop. Um, companies are already taking these steps. We know the world is going there, but n the truth is that outside of Silicon Valley and you know, Silicon Alley in New York uh, and a few other places, um, it's going to take a long time for these trends that we we know our, our, you know, the writing's on the wall, but it'll take many years. And for those of us who are either selling or thinking about joining startups, you know, I, I think you should look for startups that are kind of already 
um, ahead of the curve. And yeah. New York has a great number of them. I, I think where the companies are is they've pretty much got a mandate from you know, higher up. It's like big data is a thing. Do something about it. And they've spent a lot of money over the last you know, decade collecting this information in. I, I, I was chatting with um, one of the, uh, the, the government um, departments there who's got all the spend data that, that kind of goes between, you know, talking hundreds of billions of dollars between different things. And like, we've got it all sitting in our, in our database here, um, but we don't use it, we don't do anything with it. And we need to do something. What, what, what should I do? And I think I hear that again and again and again is we've, we've got this stuff, but we should do something. And I don't really know what I should do, um, how to do it, or, or what it even looked like if I did do it, but I've been told that there's some value here. Yeah, and I think, I think that's the kind of, average inquiry we get, too. I think that's yeah. about the level of conversation, right? It's yeah. like, it's, it's a thing. I should that's, do something. It's scary. I think, in my mind, there's all these companies who know they need to invest in data, and they usually start with this top-down project of step one, we're going to put all the data into this big Hadoop cluster. Yeah. Step two, but, question yeah. mark, question mark, question mark. <laughs> Step three, profit. Right? Yeah, it's, so, it's, sort of, it's sort of like cloud, lightning bolt, dollars. And the lightning bolt is you know, what they come to you for. And um, it's sort of... And it, it, Hadoop is, is generally, I think, mentioned a lot. Um, probably because they've got an elephant or something. I think it's quite a cute little mascot. But you, you hear Hadoop a lot. And they don't really know what it is or what, why they need it or what they want to do with it. Um, but I, I don't know, I think, I think we're really early. I think this is, this is going to take a decade to play out. You know, we're, we're literally in the first, you know, the first kind of phase of that. So you know, these things take time. I, I feel like we've got a new tagline here. Hadoop, the underpant gnomes of big data. <laughs> <laughs> square, is that Square Pants Bob or something that had that? Uh, anyway. No, it was the original South Park, remember? Oh, that was okay. where the question, question, question comes from. Yeah, the question, the question, question, question. underpants, right? Yeah. All right, other question other than these gentlemen? You next. You next. I've um, I've been doing research well, on. Can you introduce yourself? Oh, um, my my name is Alex Jackett, and I've been doing research on data analysis for you know, probably for the last ten years or so. Um, and I I'm, I'm seeing a pattern. Every fifteen years, um, you know, this this field gets rebranded. <laughs> um, so in, in mid-70s, um, the very large databases conference was, was initiated. And um, then in, in, in the end of 80s, uh, beginning of 90s, the data mining, uh, or the KDD conference, was initiated. Mm. Um, so now over the past year, we've been, we've been hearing about this data science. Okay, so we've, we've been sort of transitioning from you know, databases to data mining to um, data science. Um, you know, what's, what has changed since the data mining days? Like, it, it, was, it was exactly the same message. It was, whoa, the result is data. Let's do something with it. Okay, but what's, what's new? What has changed, say, over the past 15 years? I, I blame DJ Patel for that quite squarely on his shoulders and those, you know, make sure you tell him about that, that you're not happy with his hype. <laughs> no. Um, I mean, data science is like, a, that's a shot at DJ for those that know DJ. Um, the... Um, Data science is kind of this new thing. What's changed? I mean, I, I think underlying technologies have changed, right? It just, it's more accessible now than it was. It's more mainstream. I mean, hell, there's, there's an online you know, pro sports community that's, that's running on this stuff today. I mean, that, that's changed. That didn't exist you know, back you know, time. Having real live data streams from online ad networks kind of, you know, or Wikipedia edits kind of accessible at the touch of a button, you know, that's changed. Um, you know, the visualization tools that you can run on top of it have changed. So I think the reason you need a kind of a brand, you know, is to kind of reflect a little bit of these underlying technologies that have shifted. The same problem, though. I want to make a decision. How do I make a better decision? And that's always going to be the heart of the stuff. You know, let me make a better decision. I mean, it's, it's a great question. And, and much as I enjoyed teasing DJ, which we should do more often, um, I, I will say something about his approach, which is... With DJ, it's all about the people. And to me, that's the big difference between data science or, or data scientist and data mining. True. So True. data science has the potential to bring together a community of like-minded people who believe that good decisions are made using data, not based, you know, based on a meritocracy, not based on what school you went to or what vendor you're associated with or whatever. And <clears throat> data scientists can use open source tools available for free, 
on their laptops with data that they can download off the internet. It's a far more democratic process. You know, when I think back you know, 20 years ago to when I started in the analytics world, um, the bank I was working with had spent $20 million on HNC, custom neural network hardware, and a software platform on top of it, running on top of their new Teradata data warehouse. You know, um, today, you know, and, and, and there was no community then. You know, I had no, I had no peers. In, in Australia, there may be, maybe was like three of us who were in that field. Mm. Where else today, we have rooms of interesting people, uh, community. Um, I think it's a very different world now to what we had then. And I find it, you know, I, I think it's, I, I love it, actually. But this lady over there, you right here. There we go. No, uh, before there? Daniel, just this lady before you, and then you, and then we probably have time for just one more to this. Hi, everyone. I work for Tickrail. Uh, I think we will provide another excellent information curation tool. It's not just a news curation tool, it also curates tweets. So if you're interested, you can talk to me afterwards. So my question is nice. this. It, the introduction doesn't need to be a pitch about your company. <laughs> so okay, okay. Podcast. I'm sorry if that takes too long. No anyway, so I have a question for you guys. I'm a BD person, so I mean, really, all this talk about data scientists and, you know, like building models is kind of like a strange jargon to me. So for me, I really want to understand, uh, is this thing really just about finding you know, patterns and trends from uh, you know, ex uh, exceedingly large set of data? Is it what all this business is about, like finding trends, making predictions, and uh, hidden patterns? I mean, this is the only way that can make sense to me. Why are all this business here? So if you are storaging data, what are you using it for? And what analytics results you can provide that can ultimately benefit uh, you know, the end users? And who are the end users? That's my first question. My second question no, is let, that... Let, let's, let's just do one for now for okay. the interest of time. So okay. I, I think um, one, of the, one of the things, there's been a lot of hype around data scientists and the focus on the people. And I think that's kind of right. But in some ways, that's... We are with data scientists where we were with computers um, back in the 1940s. And if you think about what computers were, they were groups of mostly women sitting down, kind of writing log tables longhand. And they became machines over time. You know, computers went from people to machines. Data scientists will go from people to machines. And we're at the early stage of that. We're at the, uh, you know, you replace, um, you know, the rooms of uh, people writing log tables with um, groups of data scientists competing um, on Kaggle. And you know, that's, that's essentially, I think, a pretty apt analogy. Is yeah, yeah, it's really valuable at the moment, but there's no way, to Mike's earlier point, that the amount of data problems that we've got in the world are going to be solved by people. This just is not going to scale beyond that. So I think we've got five years where people are going to kind of be at the front of it, but another five years after that, we're going to start to see you know, data scientists, or whatever the term is going to be, is going to be like you know, a machine. And yeah, you need people to drive computers, absolutely. You need people to drive data scientists eventually as well. So for you know, business development, you'll probably drive a data scientist. It won't be a person. It'll be a, you know, so, I mean, a terminal. To answer a question, I guess it is about finding patterns. Um, you know, like the, the two top books of the last 10 or 20 years being Brian Ripley and Christopher Bishop's, basically but their titles both contain the word pattern recognition. So in a sense, yes, it, it is what we do with this data is we try and find patterns and then use them to generate value. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Daniel. I run the data science team at a company called Sailthrough. It's an email and ad platform. Um, and I just wanted to sort of circle back on a number of things you said. And I think it's absolutely right that a data scientist is this multifaceted thing from essentially a product manager to somebody who codes. But, but one thing that I find incredibly important is, is understanding the back-end architecture when actually doing things. And I've done a bunch of Kaggle competitions and, and I've done well. Or, so well at others. But one, th one thing that I missed there that I had ended up doing quite a bit of when I actually had started running this team and then also done a bunch of consulting work is that the sort of the second thing that I think about after I think about a worthwhile product to build or, or a problem that I'm solving is exactly the back end architecture of how it's going to be integrated. Mm -hmm. And maybe I'm not going to be the guy who's going to be doing that because I'm not a software engineer despite the fact that I can code or hack. These are completely different things. I'm not a back-end architect, but I need to be able to come into a place and understand the back-end architecture in order to make sure that what I do actually makes sense. 
that it will scale, that it will map produce, that whatever these words are. And so I just wanted you guys to touch upon that because it's, that's a, I think that's, a, that's a, an important aspect that, so that people we, don't we, talk about. And, and also to see how would you test for this, right? Yeah. Because it's a totally non-trivial thing as well when somebody comes into your room. So at last year's KDD, I sat on an interesting panel with um, Charles Elkin, who was the first ever KDD Cup winner and Netflix Prize judge, um, Claudia Perlich, who we've talked about, and Yakuta Corrin, who was Netflix Prize winner. Um, and one of the key areas of this discussion was around um, execution capability. Um, and in particular, do you need to keep that in mind as you build the algorithm? Mm -hmm. um, and if so, how the hell would you do that with a competition? Um, the unanimous mm -hmm. agreement was that you shouldn't. Um, what you should do is, is build the best damn algorithm you can first. Mm -hmm. um, and then look at the insights generated from that process and identify how to build something that executes in the time that you need on the platform that you require. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so I, I guess currently most of us think of this as a, as a two-step process, um, which I think, in my experience, seems to work fine. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I think that, I think it's a great question. I think ultimately there is this tension, and we see it, I think, in every organization between research and development and, you know, productization or implementation of those ideas. I think you see it on Wall Street with the guys who develop the algorithms and then the folks who actually you know, rewrite them into C++ and have them run. Uh, I think, you know, certainly for KDE competitions, you don't have to think about that as much. But um, I think in my experience, I, I agree with Jeremy that what you often end up doing is simplifying the algorithm that you developed down to a point that you can um, get it into production. And I'll give an example from uh, one of the data scientists we recently hired, spent two summers at Facebook. And one of the things he worked on was an algorithm for sorting your Facebook chat list. Um, which people appeared in your uh, chat list. And ultimately, you know, the original algorithm he wrote in R and had all these nice libraries that he could use. When he ultimately implemented it, he had to write it in PHP with no libraries. Now that's not a very satisfying thing to do. Uh, on the one hand, if you're a, you know, a data scientist, to have to write you know, linear regression algorithms in PHP. But on the other hand, that's the real world. Um, the ability to write things and then translate them into something that actually runs on whatever architecture, whatever backend architecture you've got is, is really important. And I think that's going to continually be a challenge is database vendors are looking for ways that people can push their analytics into the database. I think it states that data is still the center of the universe. Moving data, we live in an IO bound world. It's very difficult to move data around. Mm -hmm. So we are constantly required to find easy, flexible ways to push our algorithms into where the, the data lives, um, whether that be a relational database or a Hadoop cluster or you know, what have you. Yeah, it seems like maybe Mahout and Madlib would be the two most interesting ways to do that at the moment. Would you agree? I think the problem with Mahout is that anything, it's, Many of these things are, if you run in Hadoop, you're slow. Um, you need to be able to run in an environment that's fast. And I think that there's, um, you know, Netiza allows you to push your algorithms all the way down into, um, you know, where the data is flowing across the, the memory processor. Um, so uh, Mahout could play a role there, but ultimately, uh, you know, to your point, you have to think about your backend architecture and how, when you're done with your algorithms, do you get them into that back end architecture. The, the, I mean, the nice thing about this two-step process is that you can use the results of step one as kind of like a test set for step two, mm -hmm. which is, you know, have I got it within 1% of the error rate of step one? Is it giving the same basic results? Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's really helpful mm -hmm. if you do re-implement. Great. One, one last question. So all our presenters are going to be around um, after this, and I want, you know, to have time for guests to network outside. Uh, just gentlemen over there. Hi, um, my name is Garrett Vidal. I'm a consultant for a XML database vendor. Um, so one of the challenges uh, dealing with a lot of corporations is actually data quality issues. Um, so how are, how are products out there addressing data quality issues? Because whatever algorithms you write, if the data is no good, then the algorithm is totally going to give you wrong information. And being someone who looks at data all day, uh, I could see people come and say, yeah, this is, there, there's a lot of myth, there's a lot of uh, folklore about what the data represents. 
And when you look at the black and white, it's not that. Uh, so w what are some of the challenges that you're seeing with data quality and how, how, you, how are those being addressed? I think, Sean, you should answer because you, yeah. guys, you guys crawl. Yeah, we, we do a lot of unstructured um, data and, uh, you know, you, you're basically doing entity and event extraction on unstructured text and your false positive, false negative rates are, you know, far from what you'd want ideal. Now, you can optimize actually false positive at the expense of false negative and that's, you know, kind of, sorry, you can optimize against false positive at the expense of increasing false negative. Um, and, you know, you can, you can start to kind of figure out where, where that, you know, right line lies. Um, the, the reality is, though, you, the world is not as, you know, black and white. And so why should, you know, you expect data to, to represent black and white? I think one of the things we need to kind of move towards is, is an acceptance that just because it's data doesn't mean it's it, it real. Or it doesn't mean it's exactly there. And that's because the world is noisy. And so any kind of view on the world will be noisy or it will make some simplifications on that view of the world. And I think... You know, um, what, what do you do with that? Well, the reality is you're still going to make decisions. And the question is, is the data that I'm working with and the algorithms that are running on top of it any better than what I had just with my own eyes? And, you know, so I, I don't know if that kind of... Do kinda, you use machine learning to the, in your extraction and cleaning process? What, for the, uh, in, for the unstructured text? Mm, yeah. Because, I mean, to me, machine learning tools are um, amazing for this. Like like customer deduplication or cleaning up text fields or, you know, I just, I think, like, I don't know if you guys have used Google Refine, you know, like really nice tool, like which uses a bit of machine learning behind the scenes so you can like double click on a bit and say that's the bit I'm interested in and it figures mm -hmm. out yep. how to find it, you know. Yeah, I, I mean, there's too much of this stuff done manually to me. But you're still, you're still not going to, I mean, no matter what algorithm you're running on, like achieving 98% false, you know, false positive, 98% on the kind of the false negative side of things is, is beyond anything that's kind of out there. So, I mean, I don't know if you've, you know, from unstructured entity and event extraction, you know, kind of... So if your level is I need to get 100%, like, there aren't algorithms for that. No, I mean, it's a good point that, you know, yeah. I mean, you, you, this stuff's all fuzzy. Yeah. And accepting it as fuzzy. Is yeah. And you sort of move to a sort of probabilistic exactly. mindset. Which and I once you do that, you know, once you do that, you can start using these approximate kind of machine learning oriented tools, which suddenly opens up a whole new world. Yeah, and I think it's a mind shift, right? It is, I, definitely. I, I think ETL is a deep, hard problem that most people, ETL, extract, transform, load, or munging data is a deep, hard problem that probably we'll see some startups come out and address directly. But I hope the, so. Yeah. The last thing I guess I would say is that people make this sort of distinction of either it's machine learning or it's people. Either you've got a team in India or you know, Romania working through the data, uh, trying to make sense of it, um, or you've got some algorithm working on it. But I think there is a power with having this combination of, of machines and people, um, algorithmic exoskeleton, where you create a, a gold standard data set and then use that's people generated and then use that to train a better. I mean, Google Refine is a great example of the yeah. power of combining algorithms and people, yeah. just like Sh Sean described as being what, what exactly. Grid seeks to do. Yeah. All right, with that, let's all uh, go get a drink, and thank you very much. Thank you guys.